Hi, I'm Pastor John Edmiston, and we'll be looking at spiritual moods and how to deal with them. We're body, soul, and spirit, and sometimes our moods come from the deepest part of our being, which is our spirit, and these moods can be life-dominating. And in the Bible, we hear about a bitter spirit, an enraged spirit, a spirit of torpor, and so on. And at the deepest part of the human spirit, I'm not talking about the Holy Spirit now, I'm talking about the human spirit, that human spirit, it shapes the framework for our entire emotional life and can dictate to us what we believe to be possible or impossible for us to do. So when you're in a bad mood, everything seems hopeless and impossible. When you're in a good mood, when you're in an upbeat mood, everything seems possible and life seems rosy. So moods shape our faith. And so we've got to understand how to deal with our moods and how to have godly moods and get out of ungodly moods. And that's what this video is about. There are sources for our various moods. The first is physical. We obviously have hormones that affect our moods. We can be affected by the weather, by illnesses, by medications, by being too unfit or having too much sugar or various things in our diet. <laughs> We can also be affected by our thoughts. Our stinking thinking can put us in a bad uh, frame of mind. We can have wrong beliefs about reality that can put us in a bad mood. We can have a poor perspective on life. And of course, we can have fear and paranoia taking over our thinking and driving us to wrong conclusions. But we're not dealing with the physical. We'll leave that to the doctors. We're not dealing with the cognitive. We'll need leave that to the psychologists and to other forms of biblical teaching. We'll be dealing with the spiritual side of our moods. And the spiritual side of our moods is, moods is caused by something going wrong with your human spirit because it's afflicted by demons, it's under spiritual attack, or because of disobedience and sin in your life, spiritual dryness, lack of faith, and perhaps in some cases trauma that has broken the spirit of the person, especially trauma early on in life. Uh, other things are a spiritual folly where the person's spirit is foolish and undiscerning and a lack of spiritual discipline. So there's some of the sources of a bad or errant spiritual mood that takes effect, takes control of people's lives so that their spiritual life is not what it could be. One of the problems in today's society is what we call rationalism. And we tend to discard any spiritual source of our moods or our psychology. We tend to think we're just computers. And so there's no place for moods in our thinking because computers don't have moods. It's all about what we're thinking or some chemicals in our body. When in fact, there are deep spiritual influences that shape how we think and how we feel. In a rationalist society, we tend to say it's all just about X and we reduce it. It's called reductionism. And we don't want to think or we don't want to believe that we could be under the influence of a negative spiritual entity that's changing the way we think, believe and act. And because that seems so out of place, it seems to be something out of a Greek mythology somewhere uh, where people were inspired by various things that came upon them at sudden notice, that we discard all of that and we say, no, that's not possible. And it's our pride telling us that we couldn't be under such a thing as a spiritual attack. And also, we no longer connect our emotions with our spiritual state. We say, look at that person over there. They're drunk or they're smoking weed, and they're perfectly happy, so sin doesn't affect our emotions. Now, that's a wrong conclusion. There's nothing unhappier than a disobedient Christian who is rebelling against God. When we're in a poor spiritual state, eventually that will get to our emotions, and we will feel miserable, and we'll end up in a very bad mood. So, how important are moods to our life? Well, we find that people will do almost anything to be in a better mood. They'll do alcohol, drugs, pornography, overeating, binge shopping, gambling, excessive video uh, playing. Uh, they'll be in games forever and ever. And they can do very dysfunctional things just to satisfy their need for a mood. Our mood can tell us to do dumb things. A mood might think, oh, I'm bored. I'm in this mood. I'm in that. So I'll jump off the rails and have an affair because I'm in the mood to have an affair. And people do that. And they do crazy things. They say, oh, I've got to go and get drunk because of my bad mood. And our mood is manipulated cleverly 
of course, by the devil, but also by marketers who want to give us a good mood. And so in Australia, where I come from, poker machines are a huge uh, affliction on society. And people use these poker machines that are designed to get people and maintain people in a good mood and get them to put money into these terrible machines. So people will do almost anything to be in a good mood. And so they are very important and they are a driver of human conduct. And in today's world, we've got a wrong view of salvation. And that you might say, what's that got to do with moods? Well, we'll see. For many people, salvation is not from sin, death and hell. They say, oh, that's pie in the sky when you die. For the salvation that most people want is the desire to go from a bad feeling to a good feeling. From a feeling of being traumatized or hurt or offended to a feeling of being healed and healthy and whole. And that's why the new age has so much appeal. It doesn't talk about sin, death or hell. It doesn't require any moral change on your part. It says, look, use these techniques and you'll have good feelings one day. But it doesn't last because you can't trick God and you can't trick your own spiritual nature. Salvation is from sin, death and hell. Salvation is to sanctification, to getting better and better every day in God's way, not just in an emotional way. But Christians still want to be happy. And so, as a Christian who believes the Bible and is filled with the Holy Spirit, how can you be happy? And that's what the rest of this video is about. So, what are the effects of moods? Moods can last a long time. They can last hours, days, weeks, even months or years, and they can take control of your mind, emotions, and will. They can take control of your mental outlook and emotions. So suddenly the world seems gloomy and dark. Everything seems impossible. The world seems hopeless and you don't think that you can do anything anymore because this mood has taken over the way you think. Some moods can be extremely toxic and negative, full of hate, full of rage, full of suspicion of the world and other people, even members of your own family. So you need to be very careful about your moods because your moods do not tell you the truth and they can lead to catastrophic and very dangerous life choices that range from addictions to suicide, to feelings of hopelessness, to quitting jobs, to doing all sorts of things because a mood has taken hold of us. When someone's in a bored mood, they can go out and seek excitement in ways that are dangerous and stupid. Or they can wander into sexual affairs that destroy them and their marriage just because they were in the wrong mood, in the wrong place, at the wrong time. So we need to be aware of our moods and able to control them. Moods deceive us. Your moods, if they're from the devil, lie to you. They make you feel helpless and hopeless and that they are in control of your thoughts and your personality. The mood says you've got to feel like this and you've got to be filled with despair or hopelessness or negativity or pride or uh, all the various moods that come across us at various times. And so these moods dictate to us about what is possible and it's what is impossible. They say, you'll never write that book. You are not up to that. And the mood says, I'm not in the mood to write that book now. I'm not in the mood to do my maths exam. I'm not in the mood to do this, that or the other. And so they dictate to you what you're going to do on any given day. And eventually you keep on surrendering to the bad mood. And soon your time is consumed and frittered away with watching television or sleeping or this or that. Because you've given in to a controlling mood that's taken over your time, your emotions and your cognitive processes. Gradually, if that mood dominates you over the years, you gradually shrivel up. Your mind stops working, your emotions stops working, you become a bland, depressed person who's always in a bad mood, who people always have to tiptoe around. So your mood is lying to you and that lie can take control of your life in very subtle and very powerful ways. And you might have seen that in some people's lives. And also, moods make us feel that we must do certain things to alleviate the mood. Oh, I'm in a bad mood, I must go down the bar and drink. Or I'm in a bad mood, I think I'll go out and smoke weed. Or I'm in a bad mood, I think I'll drive my car furiously around the block and uh, then they have a car accident or something like that. Moods can make us do dumb things. Uh, where I live in the country, people get in a bad mood and they get drunk and they take a gun and they shoot it into the air. And there's a bullet hole in our shed because someone was in a bad mood and decided to shoot our shed. So that's what people do when they're in a bad mood. 
and sometimes that can land you in three places, jail, hospital or the morgue. So you've got to be careful about listening to your moods. Spiritual moods hide. Your bad mood is going to hide away because it's a demon. It's from the devil often. This is what talk, when we're talking about spiritual moods. And demons don't want to come out into the open. So they'll hide as a physical ailment or a feeling of tiredness or a rational reason in your head. And, and in uh, Proverbs it says, oh, I can't go outside because there might be a lion outside or something like that. So the mood tells you this fib and gets you to hide away and, and call it fear or nervousness or something like that. And it lies to you day in and day out and it disguises itself as various uh, physical symptoms, personality traits, etc. And for instance, moods will often disguise themselves as feelings of tiredness, exhaustion, frustration or irritation at the world. Now it's okay to be irritated if you're cut off in traffic. You're ir irritated for 30 seconds and you move along and it's not taking over your life. But if you're irritated all day, every day, and you're always blaming everything else in the world for your problems, that's probably a mood of irritability. And it's gone on, from, on and on from being five minutes of irritability to five hours to five years of being irritable. And it's been there because you've got a spiritual power of principality dominating your mind and your thoughts and telling you always to be irritable and you think, that's just me. No, it's the whispering of an evil mood in your spirit and you can and must break out of that. And they want you to, these demons, these moods, want to, you to attribute the mood to anything except the influence of the devil. They want you to, th that, to think that that mood is you. But it's not you because you're in Christ. And Christ doesn't give you those kind of moods. Christ gives you good moods, love, joy and peace. That is not you anymore if you're safe. Those bad moods are not you. There's something other than you. And you need to get rid of that thing as quickly as possible. Now let's look at King Saul. Now King Saul is known for being in a very bad mood and a violent mood. And we'll look at the scripture about King Saul. 1 Samuel chapter 16 verses 14 to 23. Now the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul and a harmful spirit from the Lord tormented him. And Saul's servant said to him, Behold now, a harmful spirit from God is tormenting you. Let our Lord now command your servants who are before you to seek out a man who is skillful in playing the lyre. And when the harmful spirit from God is upon you, he will play it and you will be well. And whenever the harmful spirit from God was upon Saul, David took the lyre and played it with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well, and the harmful spirit departed from him. So here, Saul's bad mood was due to this harmful spirit. Uh, and it says from God, but it probably means from the spiritual realms, from the divine realms. Uh, certainly God doesn't send us demons. So King Saul had this foul mood coming over him and it was coming from the spiritual realms and it was tormenting him a day and night and afflicting him day and night. And the cure was for David to come and play the lyre. Now, why did this bad mood come about? It came about because King Saul was in rebellion against God. He was in deep sin. He was deeply envious of those around him. He was quite paranoid and he'd rebelled against the Lord and the glory of the Lord, the anointing of the Lord had departed from him. Uh, it says here, now the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. Where did it go? Well, in the verse before this, it said the, the spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul and gone to David, rushed upon David with great power. And David was now the anointed one, not King Saul. And this was at the very beginning of their association together. What did the mood do? Eventually in time, the mood got worse. And here in 1 Samuel chapter 18, verses 10 and 11. The next day, a harmful spirit from God rushed upon Saul and he raved within his house while David was playing the lyre as he did day by day. Saul had his spear in his hand and Saul hurled the spear for he thought, I will pin David to the wall. But David evaded him twice. So here, the bad mood had become worse and worse. It wasn't responding to the music anymore. He was raving mad and he was violent and he was abusive and he was trying to kill David. He was trying to kill the Lord's anointed, which David now was. So what was going through Saul's heart? Extreme violence. 
He had become violent, he had become raging mad under the control of a demonic influence of some sort. And we see this, unfortunately, in domestic violence. When someone is filled with a spirit of rage and they become irritable, they become angry, they become violent, they take it out on their wives and their children and those around them, this rage drives them to a kind of insanity where they uh, go into a so almost blacked out state where they want to kill and beat people. This is not good. And what can change these people? Getting born again. Getting born again and coming out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of light. People who are do domestic violence perpetrators, of course they need to be dealt with according to the law, but they also need to get born again of the Spirit of God and get the bad mood turned into a good mood when they're filled with the Holy Spirit. And this is a spiritual issue as well as a legal and a counselling issue. And if you're a victim of domestic violence, please firstly uh, go to the appropriate authorities and seek help, but also seek help from your pastor and for someone who can counsel the perpetrator uh, to be a, become eventually a Christian, born again, peaceful and filled with the Spirit. Well, what had happened to King Saul? He became jealous, resentful, envious and afraid of David. He chased David all round the, the deserts of Israel, trying to kill him because of this foul mood and envy that was upon him. And we see the four R's here. Resolve, resent, reject and revenge. If an issue isn't resolved, it becomes a resentment. The resentment boils in that person till eventually they reject the other people or society as a whole and eventually they lash out in revenge. And at this point, in the re reject revenge, that's when the demonic is attracted to the person and starts filling their heart and mind with wild and terrible ideas. Negativity attracts the demonic. Your resentments, your unforgiven things, attract demons to you, and they will put wild and terrible thoughts in your head and try and keep you in an angry and violent mood so you do their will, because the demonic has no limit to it. It wants to steal and kill and destroy. And it does that by entrapping people in foul, terrible and violent moods. So the anointing had left Saul for David and the demonic took over Saul instead. So how do we get out of these foul and terrible moods that seem to come from demonic entities around us and in our societies? Firstly, we need to become aware that we are in, actually in a bad mood. Sometimes we can think, oh, it's just the weather, it's just the flu, it's just this, it's just my bad knee, it's just that I had a bad day. But instead, if this mood keeps on coming back and coming back and coming back, we need to stop and say, ha, huh, I might be in a bad mood. I might have a problem here that I need to deal with. Remember, when the whole world seems to stink, maybe it's your own thinking that is stinking. The illustration of a small boy who saw Grandpa uh, asleep in the rocking chair and grandpa had a huge moustache so the little naughty boy goes and gets the smelly Limburger cheese and puts it on the grandfather's moustache. Eventually the grandfather wakes up and he says this room stinks and he goes throughout the house. This whole house stinks and then he goes outside and he says the whole world stinks and that's what happens when we have stinking thinking. It's the Limburger cheese, it's the stinking thinking that makes the whole world stink. And when we're in a bad mood, the whole world stinks, even if it's full of glory and beauty and the wonders of God, we go out and all we can see is problems and difficulties. So when you feel that way, when you feel hopeless and full of problems and difficulties, when a bad mood is taken over your life, be aware, it's probably your stinking thinking, it's probably a bad mood. Once you wake up to the fact that what's going on, that you're in this bad mood, then you must be determined to deal with it. And you must say, okay, bad mood, you're getting out of my life once and for all right now. Uh, before we get to the solution, let's look at some inadequate Christian responses that, unfortunately, us as pastors tend to fall into. We tell people to just read their Bible and pray, or we tell them, you will get over it, just snap out of it, or we lecture the person and tell them how sinful their bad mood is, or we overanalyze them with pop psychology. Or we try and play doctor and say, oh, your spiritual mood is something like bipolar syndrome. Don't do that. You're not a doctor. Leave that to the physicians. 
you go and deal with the spiritual component of the move. How do we get out of the move? Number one, we repent from rebellion and sin so that we destroy the deep spiritual roots of the evil move. If the person is not born again, they should get saved. They should commit their life to Jesus Christ as Lord and Saviour, get born again and get the new nature that comes from God. Also, they may need to repent of specific sins, such as pornography or sins of the occult, such as witchcraft, Ouija boards, astrology, divination, and things like that. These things attract the demonic into the life, particularly the worship of idols. Idols brings a curse on us, according to Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 25 and 26. It's an abomination, and it attracts the demonic into your life and causes a lot of trouble. Get rid of those things from your house, and you will notice your house becomes a lot more peaceful when you burn occult books and idols and things like that. Next thing you want to do is remove the resentments that attract the demons. Remember the four R's, resolve, resent, reject, revenge. Start forgiving everybody in your life. Write their names and say down on a piece of paper and say, I forgive them, I forgive them, I forgive them, and then go and burn that piece of paper. Get rid of the resentments. Forgive and keep on forgiving until your heart is clean and pure. And then you will find the demons are able to leave your life alone. You've got rid of the junk that attracts the rats. You've got rid of the mess in which they can make their home by forgiving others and walking in the spirit. Next thing you need to do is reason with the strong delusions that are created by the evil mood. Evil moods lie to us and create strong delusions of what we can and can't do, what is true, is not true, what we can believe and what is unbelief. A lot of unbelief is a hardened state in a depressed mood that says you can't, it will never happen to you, God will never come through to you and so on. So you need to reason with the strong delusion. This is the example of an artist. The artist had come to the conclusion long ago that he could not ever draw again. He was depressed. Years and years he said, I can't do it. I can't possibly ever draw again. It's all over for me. So the wise counsellor said, just draw a straight line for me, will you? God gave him pen and paper and the, the artist drew a straight line. And then he looked at the straight line and said, I can draw. I can draw. And rushed out of there the counseling session and started doing work again because the, the lie had been broken. The lie had been tossed out of that person's life and now the mood was gone and the power of the mood over that person to uh, occupy them with lies and deceit had been shattered. And so that's what you've got to do. You've got to confront your moods. If you say, oh, I can't possibly mow the lawn. I'm too tired. I'm too exhausted. Uh, I'm feeling frail. And then you just say to yourself, well, I, I'm going to get out the the lawnmower, I'm going to just mow a little bit of the yard. You get out there with the lawnmower, you mow a little bit of the yard, and, oh, yes, I can do it. I'm not as tired or sick or exhausted as I thought. I was just in a mood of helplessness and hopelessness. And so that's what you've got to do. You've got to confront the lie that your mood is getting you into. How do you stay out of the bad mood? You adopt biblical beliefs instead of paranoid and self-centered beliefs. Bad beliefs lead to bad feelings. Biblical beliefs lead to good feelings because they tell you about the truth, about God, His sovereignty, His care for you and His love for you. Base your life on biblical beliefs and you won't be as afraid. You won't be grabbing hold of life to control it. You'll know that all things are possible with God and that'll put you in a good mood. Learn to stop comparing yourself with others. Facebook and Instagram can paint a glamorous picture of life we cannot possibly live up to as ordinary everyday people. Learn to be content with where you are. As the Bible says, learn to be content with your house, your family, your children and your life. And stop comparing yourself with other people. God's going to bless you right where you are. Next, give up expecting life to be fair. The classic example of this is in Luke 16 of the rich man and the poor man named Lazarus. Lazarus was covered in sores. He was laid at the rich man's gate. And the rich man ignored him day and night. And life was not fair. This selfish rich man had everything. Was clothed in purple and fine linen. Rode about in a chariot. Uh, and then the poor man seemed to have nothing at all. And eventually he dies. And eventually the rich man dies. What happens? The rich man is tormented in hell. Day and night in the flames. In terrible discomfort. Uh, and what's happening now to Lazarus? Lazarus is comforted in the bosom of Abraham. What seemed to be unfair 
has now been made fair. We've got to remember that we have heaven. We have an afterlife. And in that afterlife, the circumstances of this life will often be changed. So we look at the rich people, the billionaires and their yachts, and we think, oh, I'd like that. Why do I work so hard and get nowhere? Wait and see once you enter into the kingdom of God, where the last will be first and the first will be last. God will sort that out. The next thing you need to do is appreciate the life you've got, appreciate God, appreciate other people, have an attitude of gratitude and praise. As you move towards the positive, the negative will be left far behind. Develop an attitude of thankfulness in all things, as the Bible says, and you will enter into his courts with praise. So do that. Have a praise-filled life. Okay, now how do you get rid of the bad mood? If you want to drive the bad mood away, you need to use the spiritual authority that God has given you as a Christian when he seated you in the heavenly realms with Christ Jesus. And you can find out that about, you can find out about that in Ephesians 2, 6 and 7 and Ephesians 1, 20 and 21. You can drive the bad mood away just as if it was a, an annoying yapping dog that was trying to keep you in a corner all the time, but you really have authority over that dog. I remember this when I was a circuit preacher. I'd preach four times on a Sunday and then on the Monday I often felt tired. And then eventually I felt tired and depressed. Then I felt tired, depressed and angry at God. And it went from five minutes to half an hour to all day. Eventually I was, this bad mood was going all the way to Wednesday. And I rang a friend of mine who was in the United States. I was in Australia at the time. And this friend said to me, treat it like it's a demon. And I thought, that is crazy, Claire. Yeah, that was his name. Claire was a guy. Uh, and he said, and I, but I thought, I tried. I'm so desperate. So next Sunday, I preached four times on the Sunday. Monday morning, I have this black mood over me. And I'm walking along Karanya Street in Townsville. I remember it's clear as day. I'm halfway along the street. And uh, the bad mood's over me. I said, I'll try what Claire said. And so I said, bad mood, go away, stay away. I don't want you. I rebuke you now in Jesus' name. Six seconds later, the mood was gone. My head was clear. I was fine. It was a revolution. I had control over this mood that had been plaguing me for months and months. So next week, I go out. I preach four times on, on Sunday. Get up Monday morning. Still feel bad. So I try it again. Six seconds later, the bad mood's gone. It's fantastic. The week's free ahead of me. And so I, I thought, this is great. So for a few weeks after that, maybe five or six weeks, this kept happening and I kept rebuking it and then it went away and it stayed away. Never came back. Now I can preach and I'm sure I'll get tired, but I don't have that bad mood again. I don't have those thoughts again. I don't have those things about woe is me because I'm preaching and no one's paying me or stuff, stuff that preachers go through. Uh, and so uh, I do this and uh, I had control over this bad mood by rebuking it. So you rebuke it like it's a, a, a dog that's trying to drive you into a corner, and you try and name it. For instance, you say, bad mood of hopelessness and depression, or something like that. Get out of my life, in Jesus' name, amen. And here's a little sample prayer. Bad mood, mood of jealousy and despair and victim mentality. I command you to go away, stay away, and to never come back, in Jesus' name, amen. Let's look at that for a moment. Bad mood, you're starting to name it. Then you get a bit more specific. Mood of jealousy and despair and victim mentality. You're getting some idea what the mood's trying to say to you, the type of lies it's trying to put into your head. I command you to go away, stay away, and to never come back in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, you might think uh, that's stupid. because I thought that. I thought this was the dumbest thing ever. But I was so afflicted by this mood, I tried it, and it worked. And other people tell me it works. So if you're in a bad mood, and you want to get it out of your life, and you see that it's been afflicting you for a long time, try that. See how it goes. Tell the mood to go away firmly in a very authoritative tone of voice. It can be inside your head, but you can speak it outside as well. And tell that mood to get out of your life. The next thing is to set your mind on the spirit. Let's look at Romans 8, 4-6. In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, and they end up in a very bad mood. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, 
but to set the mind on the spirit as life and peace. The flesh is very close to what we would call the ego. It's our physical desires, uh, it's our lusts, and it's our pride, it's our love of the world, and all those kind of things. And if we are self-centered and ego-centered and lust-centered, that is spiritual death, and it leads to terrible moods and darkness of spirit and soul. But if we set our mind on spiritual things and on things above, we set our mind on worshipping God and reading the Bible and prayer and attitude of gratitude, we will experience life and peace. And life and peace leads to good moods being in your life. So here's the secret. Set your mind on things of the spirit, not on things of the flesh. If you set your mind on things of the flesh, it will get darker and darker. If you set your minds on the things of the spirit, light will break forth in your life. Next thing is to be filled with the Spirit. And here we have two different ways of being in a good mood. Here, Ephesians 5, 18 to 21. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. So that's one way of getting a good mood, is get drunk with wine. Here's the godly alternative. But be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting one another to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now that's a whole sermon if you want it, but it's saying be filled with the Spirit. Don't be filled with marijuana or booze or all the other things the world offers you. Be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. And Luke 11 tells us we can be pray, we can pray to be filled with the Spirit and God will give us the Holy Spirit in measure or without measure. So we seek, we ask, we knock, we say, Lord Jesus Christ, please fill me with the Holy Spirit and give me strength for this day. I often pray that in the morning. Now, nothing terribly magical happens. I, no huge spiritual phenomenon takes over my life, but I feel solid, I feel confident, and I feel positive, and I feel able to get through my day. So ask the Lord Jesus Christ, please, Lord Jesus, fill me with your Spirit. Fill me with the fruit of the Spirit. Fill me with the various gifts of the Spirit. Fill me with the things I need to get through the day. Courage, wisdom, love and hope. We ask God to fill you with spiritual things. Pray a little prayer like this. Lord Jesus Christ, please fill me with your spirit. Joy and thankfulness today in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, how do we get into a better mood? Spirit-filled worship. Remember David and his lyre, the worship drove away the spirit for the bad mood for some time but of course Saul wasn't born again so it wasn't effective but for us spiritual spirit filled worship going into the temple of God going into the place of worship can completely change how we think and we'll see that in Psalm 73 secondly you can speak to your own soul with authority because your soul gets into these moods and like David would say to his soul why are you downcast oh my soul and then he would say yet I will rejoice in the Lord he takes command of his feelings and licks them into shape by commanding himself into a better mood. Of course, and we've often seen this, cast your cares upon the Lord in prayer. God does care for you. He cares for every aspect of your life. Remind yourself of the sovereignty of God, of the care of God for you, and cast everything upon him with prayer and thanksgiving. And let your request be known to God and the peace of God will garrison your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Now in Philippians 4.8, it tells us to refocus our mind. Take our mind off our anxieties, which is in 4, 6 and 7, and put them onto things above in verse 8. So we look on things above, things pure, holy, good and worthy, and we focus our mind away from ourself onto the heavenly things and the spiritual things, and they fill our minds instead. And that takes us into a better place and into a better mood. Some long-term solutions just for our daily uh, life. We can find food and rest just like Elijah did after he was chased by Jezebel and got into a mood of despair and the angels just bought him food and let him have a nap and he got better. Next thing is to invest in your key high-quality relationships that make you feel anchored and solid. Spend your most time with the people who do you the most good. Don't surround yourself with people who drag you down, who are negative, who are irritating or annoying. Find relationships and friendships that 
buoy you up. I've always had a prayer partner or two in my life that I can go to outside of my church and outside of my family who help me to be sustained in ministry. You need people around you or a Bible study group around you that keeps you encouraged in the Lord. Seek out those relationships and spend some time sustaining them. And we find Paul did that. He would seek out Titus or Silas or Barnabas or someone and say, I need to be with this person now and make relationships part of your priority. Spend time with the good people in your life. Then, of course, maintain reasonable physical fitness. Because if you're unfit, that's going to set you into a, a bad physical mood. But the bad physical mood can slide into becoming a bad spiritual mood because it gets taken advantage of by the devil. Don't burn yourself out in the ministry. Take care of your body and of your own fitness level. Okay, the next thing is to stay away from worldly thinking. Worldly thinking plunges us into a bad mood because we always want the, the fame, the money, the glamour, the looks that we can't have. Uh, and the world gets into our head and it sucks us away into places that a Christian should not go. You should separate from negative, sinful people, the sort of people that your evil mood draws you into being with. If you're rebelling against God, if you're in sin, You'll go and you'll find all the backslidden Christians down the pub and you'll hang out with them uh, and you'll tell stories about how bad church is and how judgmental Christians are and say, well, I still believe in God, but, you know, I think we can drink and get drunk and do this and do that. Uh, and you'll hang out with all these backslidden people and they will take you straight down to hell. They'll take you well away from the Lord because the demon wants you to hang out with other people that have the same demon. And all the demons have a great old time feasting on you. So... Don't go into Babylon. Don't go into the worldly places. Don't go into those places where you see all these negative people that have rejected God. They're not your friends. You, they, you might think that they understand you. They don't understand you They don't because the real you, the eternal you, is headed for heaven. And if you're born again, there's part of you that's headed for heaven no matter what. But you don't want to get into a backslidden state and burn up your reward in Christ. Separate from also from worldly prideful people who have the lifestyle of Babylon, wealth and glamour and glitz and pride, and pride and they always have contempt for other people and they think Christians are so dumb and we're so wise and so on and so forth. And this Babylonian thinking of luxury and self-intoxication, intoxication with how much they've made it in the world and they get further and further from God in their pride because God is far from the proud but he's close to the humble and contrite in heart. So walk away from those people as well and refuse to envy the wicked. There's two Psalms, 37 and 73, back to front. 37 and 73, they're both long. We don't, we don't have time to go through them here. But in Psalm 73, David says he was like a brute beast within him. He was so envious of the wicked. He was so chewed up with anger at God. He was in this terrible mood until he went into the house of God and saw the fate of the wicked. And when he was worshipping, that changed his mood forever. He said, now I trust you, God. So refuse to envy the wicked. Go to the presence of God. Go to the Holy Spirit. And that will put you in a much better mood than looking around at all the terrible things that are happening in this world. The next thing, and uh, our last slide for uh, this bit, is to move from why to how to. The why question tends to lock you into a victim mentality and the how to question tends to lock you into a victor overcoming wisdom mentality. So you need to stop asking, why am I poor? That's never made anyone rich, that question. Why am I poor? Why am I poor? It's just asking you uh, how you could fix the blame for being poor. That doesn't fix the problem. Fixing the blame does not fix the problem. But if you ask, how can I make and manage my money in a godly way? God will give you wisdom for that because God gives wisdom generously and without reproach. James 1, 5 to 8. So you need to start moving from the problem to the solution. From problem-focused thinking to solution-focused thinking. Stop asking, why is my relationship so painful? And start asking, how can I improve my relationship? Go to the Lord and say, Lord, how can I improve my relationship with my wife, my husband and my children? God will give you the answer. Day by day, bit by bit, follow God's instructions and your relationships will improve. So keep asking, how can I be better with my wife, better with my kids? How can I 
move this way or that, and the, the wise answers will come to you as you seek wisdom to run your relationship better. It will, it will improve. Why questions get us stuck in a victim mentality, and that victim mentality leads to sourness of spirit and very bad moods. So I move from the why questions to the how-to questions, and God will be with you. Well, this is John Edmiston signing off uh, with this video. And I'd just like to tell you a little bit about my book, Biblical EQ. I wrote it in 2001. I wrote it primarily for missionaries in extremely stressful situations, but other people have found it very helpful, including military people and various professional people who are interested in emotional intelligence, leadership and emotional transformation. You can find that book at biblicaleq.com. And if you want to contact me, you can, ink, you can always email me at johned at aibi.ph. This is John Edmiston signing off. God bless you all.